We would now like to call upon our chief guest, Shri Sanjeev Sanyalji, Member Economic Advisory Council of the Prime Minister, for his address. Uh, sustainability uh, kinds of norms, thoughts, etc., to uh, the corporate um, world, but more uh, broadly in terms of how we manage uh, the world. Now, as many of you are aware, there has been recently a proliferation of global indices, uh, norms, uh, environment, social uh, 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 governance, kind of ESG kind of norms. Um, that have uh, become now quite a large part of the uh, conversation, uh, increasingly being applied, enforced in some cases, uh, to the way we manage the world. Um, and as a result, there has been also a proliferation of large numbers of NGOs, government departments, um, regulators, uh, foreign, uh, uh, or rather international agencies, which issue certifications, norms, indices, and so on, uh, on whether or not uh, countries, companies, individuals, etc., are adhering with uh, what we want from uh, in terms of uh, environmental, social, and governance uh, uh, standards. So what I'm going to do today is actually to turn the gaze and look at whether or not these systems of managing these uh, 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 of uh, certification. Who are these agencies that certify these things? What is the basis on which they do it? And is it a meaningful way of actually managing the planet? Because much is uh, uh, stated about it, and very often you will see that there is a peculiar way in which India specifically is uh, viewed in these many of these indices. So, next slide, please. So you have this very absurd thing that happens every year, that you have a global hunger index that comes up, and it views India as being 111 out of 125 countries in the global hunger index. At the same time, we are also told that 25% of Indians are obese, and then India actually has an obesity time bomb. Now, frankly, the world needs to decide which one is true. You can't be obese and hungry at the same time. Now, I understand that obesity can happen because uh, it can be also happen with various kind of nutritional imbalances. But hunger is not about nutritional imbalances. Hunger is a very specific way of thinking about lack of food. It's about specifically a calorific deficiency. So if you have calorific deficiency, and we are 111 out of 125 countries, then we certainly can't be in a position where we have an obesity problem. And in fact, in that hunger index, the countries that are below us, in, uh, sorry, are better than us in the, uh, in, in the hunger index, are countries like Ethiopia, Syria, Pakistan, North Korea, Sudan, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. And many of these countries are countries that are dependent on food aid from India. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the question is, why do these global indices matter? Now, these global indices have been coming out for a long, long time. And there's been a proliferation of them because obviously there's a lot of talk about sustainability of various kinds. And so we have begun to not really notice them because of the proliferation. But so far, the attitude had been, you know, let barking dogs continue to bark. But it is actually a bad strategy. Because what happens is that these indices end up having real life impact on our lives. So, for example, when you talk about sovereign ratings, and sovereign ratings impact the cost of capital of not just the country, but of also uh, the country, then do remember something like 18 to 20 percent of the weightage of a sovereign ratings, whether it's Moody's, SP, Fitch, and so on, that is actually comes out of some of the, uh, an, uh, uh, an, uh, sort of some sort of a weighted average of many of these indices. Many of these are weighted together into, by the World Bank into something called the World's Governance Indicators. The, the World Bank itself does not come up with these indicators. All it does is takes a bunch of indicators, gives it some arbitrary weight, and then these are then used widely for all kinds of things. 
This same thing happens with ESG and other things as well. I've given here an example of the JP Morgan Asset Management Sovereign ESG Scoring Framework. And you will see that this is essentially a weighted average of various kinds of things, particularly World Bank driven um, uh, numbers. And many of these things are then, as I said, feeding their way into how actual decision making is done. JP Morgan has hundreds of billions of dollars of allocation, large investments in India as well. And clearly they are being influenced by some of these indices. So we need to pay attention to them. We can't just say, let barking dogs bark. Next please. So now let me give you some examples of some of the gems of some of these indices. This is from VDEM. VDEM is Varieties of Democracy Index. It's a uh, Stockholm, Sweden based uh, uh, institute, very highly regarded by many. Its indices on various things, from democracy, freedom and so on, all end up indirectly into many things, as I said, particularly through the World Bank's Global Governance Index. And in it, this is the democracy index that I've given. This is the liberal democracy index of 2022, where the world's largest democracy, India, is ranked at number 97. Fair enough, maybe we are genuinely a flawed democracy, and we deserve to be at 97. So who are the countries that are ranked above us? Well, it turns out, number one is Kingdom of Denmark. Number two is Kingdom of Sweden. Third is Kingdom of Norway. In fact, the main finding from this index is being a kingdom is good for democracy. <laughs> In fact, it's just not just about the first few on the top. The whole list is absurd. And we have country like at number 64, you have the Kingdom of Lesotho, which had a military coup in 2014, had an emergency in 2020, and then again in 2022. So this country is ranked number 64 when we are at 97. There's Kosovo, which was only declared its independence from Serbia in 2008. So these are countries without even a reasonable record of democracy for any length of time. The sheer absurdity of this, and yet this ends up actually indirectly into various indices. Next please. So the VDEM, when you read their report on uh, various countries, it ranks India as an electoral autocracy. Now, whatever that means, I'll let you guess what electoral autocracy means. Wonderful term. And it basically then goes on to say, and the most, then it has this, uh, you know, uh, uh, situation where it says a gradual deterioration where freedom of media, academia, civil society, etc., were curtailed first and to the greatest extent. So, it's not really bad situation. I mean, we are now uh, almost in a North Korea-like situation here in India. But guess where? When the last time, we, you know, we had a similar score in India uh, uh, for democracy. Turns out it was in 1975 to 76, which was the period of emergency. Now, some of the students may not be old enough, but their parents certainly will. And I am certainly old enough to remember the emergency. The emergency was a complete suspension of fundamental rights and democracy in India, the only period in our entire post-independence history where we had this. Now, no matter how, what you think about the current government, it's certainly very difficult to make the case that we are under the same situation as we were under the emergency in 1975-76. to 76. And yet, this is what is casually used uh, by VDEM. Next. And it doesn't go, to require too much imagination to know what is going on here. You see, if you just go and look at the index itself and its time series, you will see that suddenly something happens in 2014 where these indices suddenly begin to deteriorate. Now, what happened in 2014? I wonder. <laughs> so, it is quite obvious that this is essentially a political agenda, ideological agenda driven index. Now, of course, anybody in the world is free to come up with an index. The question is, how do they create these indices? Next. So, in this specific VDEM democracy index, it includes two kinds of inputs. One is, these are subjective inputs and then objective inputs. Now, the objective inputs are factual inputs that are uh, like 
minimum voting age, percentage of population with suffrage, election type, and so on. And in those, India has actually continues to score 100%. There's no change at all. Where it suddenly changes is through the opinions. An opinion poll is taken of a tiny number of experts. And in fact, in all of these things, all these indices, we have now figured out, tiny number, five to 10 experts basically rank the whole world. I mean, if you wanted to do an election of this room, five to 10 experts would not be considered a significant sum. And they are ranking the whole world based on these opinions of unnamed experts. We don't even know who these experts are. So, I mean, it's basically some of us can get together tomorrow over a drink and rank the world. And this is expected to be, you know, how the world is supposed to be governed. You've got to be kidding me. Next. This is another one. This is the Academic Freedom Index of VDEM. This is the Academic Freedom Index of 2002. India is in the bottom 10 to 20 percent. So who are the luminaries above us? Afghanistan. <laughs> You've really got to be kidding me. In 2022, 20, Russia was above us. Now, of course, it's not in favor, so I suppose it will go down. But, you know, there are countries in there that are not even democracies of any meaningful kind where we know for a fact that this is, these things are not true. But by the way, what happened is that after this 2002 thing came out, there was so much mocking on social media that in 2023, the number was changed and Afghanistan is now mercifully below us. But that is mostly a response to social media. Next, please. Now, this is another one. Reporters on Frontier or Reporters Without Borders. This is another NGO, international NGO, that does these kinds of rankings. And the report for India states that things are somewhere between problematic to very bad. And so much so that we are ranked, as you can see, at 161 out of, I think, 162 countries. And the countries above us are also quite illuminating. Palestine, Afghanistan, Sudan, Hong Kong, Somalia. I mean, have they even visited Hong Kong? I mean, so the point I'm making is there's not even a pretense of attempting to be, you know, objective about this whole thing. Next. This is yet another one. This is Freedom House, which is a uh, US government funded think tank in, in Washington, I think it is, it's somewhere in the US anyway. And you can see again, you know, we are, we are now evidently partially free. So who are the luminary countries that are ranked above us? One of them happens to be Northern Cyprus, by the way, which is a country that is not even recognized by the UN. It is a part of the island of Cyprus in the north, which is occupied by Turkey in the 70s. And evidently it, get, it is ranked lots above us, much higher uh, score. We have a score of 66, they have a score of 76. And evidently they're a wonderful democracy for the simplest reason they have ethnically cleansed their entire Greek population. Now, next. So, I've just given you a flavor of them, but you know, by and large, if you go through all these index, indices, you will by and large see something of this nature. And they're all based on the opinions of an unknown bunch of tiny number of unknown experts who we have never told who they are. And they are based on questions that are also quite absurd. For example, you have questions which the Economist Intelligence Unit has. So it gives out a question, so we have the question, we don't know who fills them out, but we do have the question. And it says, how pervasive is corruption? Now if I did some, some poll in this room, tell you to, you know, how pervasive is corruption in this country on a scale to 1 to 10, there will be a huge variety of opinions. I mean, there is no objective way of doing this. And just imagine, they are not just doing it for countries over time, they are doing it across countries. Similarly, you have a question which we then does, to what extent is direct popular vote utilized? Now, this is a category on which India gets a score of zero. Now, what does direct popular vote mean? It's basically a referendum. Yeah. Now, how do you do a referendum with 1.4 billion people? 
You can't. This is a meaningful thing for a tiny place like Switzerland. Yeah? To be expecting us to do a referendum is ridiculous. And even if a somewhat mid-level country like say the UK does a referendum, and the results turn out to be Brexit or something that VDEM doesn't approve of, then they get very annoyed about the whole thing. So, what we have here is a very selective use of certain experts and media reports that are used to then uh, justify this. Next. Now, I have been actually making a fuss about this for the last few years. I published several reports, many of you read it in newspapers or technical papers and so on. And so, as a result of this, some questioning has now started. Uh, 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 so, whenever VDEM, for example, makes a presentation somewhere, someone in the audience stands up and asks questions, then their methodology. Amazed they got away for, with half a century without anybody asking them their methodology. But anyway, somebody has now questioned. So, finally, some, so the director of uh, VDEM, who is much short, I have there up uh, in front of you, was asked by, in an interview about, you know, all the questions are raised. So, the Honorable Director avoided all the methodological questions I raised. Instead, he says, you know what? Our results must be true because they, they, are, they are driven by high maths and supercomputers. Now, they thought that they were going to intimidate Indian researchers with maths and computers. You've got to be kidding me. And here is a quote from that presentation. It says, how do we aggregate them? It's a complicated statistics because it is the gold standard of the latest Bayesian item response theory modeling. By the way, I can explain this to you in about one hour to everybody in this room, even if we've never done maths before. There's nothing very complicated. I have no idea how on earth, why they need supercomputers basically to put together and compute the opinions of just a tiny number of so-called experts. I have no idea. You can do it on Excel sheet. They immediately need supercomputers to do it. And they then make this up. We use supercomputers. It is almost like asking astronomers how do you use their calculations. By the way, we do ask astronomers how do they do their calculations. In fact, there is a long history of this going back to Kepler and Galileo. And if you are Indian, back to Aryabhatta and Brahmadatta. The code for this is also open for anyone to see, but it's complicated. If you have half a year, you've got to be kidding me, half a year to do something which will take an hour, we can teach it to you. We are not astronomers, but we are the astronomers of social science. I mean, just listen to the utter patronizing tone in which the responses are. There's not even an attempt to explain what they are doing. And they get away with this bullshit. Next. But the problem is not only with these perception based indices. We have discovered, as I have gone through all of this, that there is serious problems with things that claim to be based on hard objective data as well. And I'm going to show you some of these. Next. Here is something that the UNDP and WHO uh, use for many things, including the Human Development Index, which as you know is a widely used indicator. And one of the inputs into it, the HDI, is life expectancy of birth. Most of you will know this. Life expectancy of birth means that when a baby is born, at that point, what is the expected, expected length that this child is, can expect to live? That is life expectancy at birth. Now, what happened is, in for the 2020, uh, uh, so the 2021 uh, uh, indicator for life expectancy birth, as uh, calculated by the UN World Population Prospects, suddenly reduced our um, life expectancy at birth from 70.9 to 67.2. Now, sudden drop, after, and the second largest drop of any country in the world. And this has been done evidently because of COVID. Now, first of all, there is a conceptual error here. Because, as you all know, COVID does not impact young people. Only impacts people past 21. So, what implicitly they are saying here, 
is that the problem of COVID is, is going to impact that child 21 years later. In other words, for 21 years, COVID is going to be a problem. Because only then will this COVID problem begin to actually hit the child. So first of all, this is an entirely fraudulent way of thinking about the whole thing. But let, anyway, let's persist. So, of course, we asked them, why did you do this? So they came up with this indicator that, you know, the number of excess COVID deaths uh, in India, according to the WHO, is 4.7 million people. This is far in excess of our official estimates and is the highest number of people evidently who died from COVID anywhere in the world, by some margin, as you can see. The next guy is Indonesia. So we asked them, I mean, how did you get this data? I mean, did you do a survey which was different from ours? What is the thing? So they said, no, we generated it out of a model. Huh? What? And what did you feed into the model? Oh, we read newspaper, we read newspaper reports from so-called credible sources, like New York Times. So on the basis of that, they gave us the highest number of deaths. Okay, fine. Let's say we accept that number. Okay. Now, India is the world's most populous country. Yeah. So anything you do will be the largest number will be in there. Highest number of deaths are also in India. Highest number of births will also be in India. Everything will be highest in India. So you have to do the reasonable thing, which is you have to normalize it by population. So when you do it by per 1 lakh population, 100,000 population, you look at the number of deaths. We are not, we are just taking whatever the WHO says. Messy and unreliable as those numbers are. Just take those numbers, normalize a population of 100,000, and it turns out that India has one of the lowest in the world, even with their estimates. Now, surely this is what should be used for calculating life expectancy of birth. Yeah? This is their number, not mine. And you can see all these countries are above us in terms of the number of deaths from COVID per. 100,000 population. Brazil, US, Italy, UK, Argentina, Indonesia, Germany, France. And yet, when you go to the last table, the estimated changes in life expectancy in India are the highest. So India, they shaved off 3.7 years from our life expectancy, which is a change of 5.2%, which is higher than all these countries. And as you can see in there, you know, country like the US, uh, you know, have much higher, it's all, a little less than double of the number of deaths per 100,000, and yet the amount they reduced it is a, much, is a small number. So clearly, again, the so-called use of these hard data has to be questioned again. There has to be a turning of gaze on these numbers. They simply do not even stand up to common sense. Next. Same thing, female labor participation, you'll hear this, you know, India needs to improve with female labor participation. I'm not saying that it should be done, perfectly reasonable thing to want to do. Problem is with the estimates that the ILO comes up with, yeah, it is very well known that India's own PLFS data underestimates female labor participation. And the number comes out to be 32.5, it is very well known that this is an underestimate and in fact, a paper it was written 10 years ago on this subject by no less than Capsos in 2014. Now just so that you know, Professor Dr. Capsos is currently the head of ILO, uh, ILO's uh, research wing. So he's more than aware that our number actually underestimates the number and yet he then runs some model and reduces the estimate from 32.5 to 24 when his own paper says that it should be going to something like 54%. So again, not even a pretense of ideological agenda-driven biases. Next, please. So all of these are there, I have now showed you in international agencies. But sadly, this is also true of our own data gathering. And I am going to show you how India's own statistical systems have Strange biases, and I'll tell you why they exist. Next. Anemia. You will be told that, you know, the bulk of Indian women and children suffer from anemia. We've known this for years, decades, and we have large interventions, fortification of food, spraying them with 
folic acid, all kinds of things that have happened. And let me show what has happened as a result of this. So between 1998 and 2021, the number of children under 5 with anemia have dropped from 70% to 67%. Now we have, in this time, our per capita income has risen, we have become clearly richer, better fed, etc. Huge amount of intervention has happened. It's barely budged from 70% to 67% of under 5 kids with anemia. The number of women with anemia, however, have actually gone up from 52% to 57%. Yeah? And if people want even more intervention in order to supposedly reduce into this anemia. So I actually looked into this issue and I've published a paper on this. It turns out that there is, there is a serious data gathering problem. You see, when you collect blood for looking at anemia, they have to look at hemoglobin. They have to do two things. One is there is to be a global, there is a benchmark against you have to measure it. And second, you have to collect the blood. Now, when you collect the blood in India, all the blood is connected by essentially a pinprick. But when you do this, the blood gets oxidized in a particular way. And it is, there are many, many papers published in reputable journals such as, uh, you know, uh, Lancet and so on, which tell you that that is not the way to collect the blood because it will certainly lower your measurement of hemoglobin. You have to do an intravenous method. They have to pull the blood out of the vein. That is the only sensible way of pulling blood out for measuring anemia. You can do other diseases maybe, but anemia has to be done in this particular way. Second, there is another problem. The benchmark that we use for deciding what is the correct level of anemia is based on WHO studies done in 1968 in North America and Europe. Whereas there are many subsequent studies that tell you that the normal level of hemoglobin in blood varies widely according to ethnicities and those of Asians is significantly lower. In the US, for example, for different ethnicities, the US itself states that you don't use the same benchmark. And yet, we are using what is called the WHO benchmark, which is clearly too high for us. And the basis of this, we are carrying out massive amounts of interventions which clearly are not working. So, what happens if you correct for these two elements? And so there is a study in the Lancet Global Health which shows that if both the measurement and the benchmark issues are corrected and prevalence in anemia in under 5 children reduces from 67% as per NFHS, which is our own survey, to 15.4%. It goes from 67% to 15%. Now, 15% is still a significant number and we certainly need to do something about it, but it is clearly a completely different scale number, yeah? And this error, we can't blame on anyone else. This is happening in, this is happening due to uh, the, 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 the poor way in which data is collected and benchmarked in our own national family and health survey. Next, please. Similar thing happens with childhood stunting. You see, we, according to the NH21, estimates suggest that 35% of Indian children are stunted. Now, what is the benchmark against you which you look at this stunting? And this has been written, this is not a new discovery by me, this has been written about for some years now. The problem is, the benchmark is a global one. And this global benchmark of stunting how did the benchmark uh, be derived? Well, it was done because of a sample of a very small number of 8,440 people in the years 97 to 2003. The sample was done in the following countries, US, Brazil, Ghana, Norway and India. Now, not surprisingly, even in the sample, the original sample, Indian children were well below the average for the rest. Now these are some of the tallest in the world. West Africa, Norway, Brazil, US. According to this, even I am stranded. <laughs> and even for the survey that was done in India, which was for 1490 infants, which was done 
The Indian survey was done actually in Defence Colony in Delhi. It was done there because that is the affluent neighbourhood. Uh, clearly there is no malnutrition there, everybody there is rich, they have the best medical facilities. And so, and they are Punjabis by the way, they are ethnically the taller population in this country. And even they, when the original survey was done, were the shortest people in the survey. Now just imagine, how do you expect kids in northeast of India or Bengal etc. who are naturally smaller to be counted naturally, not surprisingly, everybody turns out to be considered stunted in this country. How wonderful. Next. Now this kind of problem is arising and I investigated what this is going on to where these surveys come from. It turns out there's something very fishy about the whole thing, about how these NAP NHFS and other surveys get actually done. Because it turns out that most of these questions in, in, in the guise of so-called international collaboration, these surveys are actually designed almost entirely by USAID. We didn't know this, by the way, at least in the government we didn't know this. And the reason it caught our attention is because when I began to go through the NHFS survey, we came across some really bizarre questions that couldn't be possibly of any policy use. For example, here is the page on malaria. So you would think, you know, malaria is a serious issue, there should be a page of questions on it. But it would be perhaps the questions would be on mosquitoes, has anyone in your family got malaria recently or some such thing. But in fact, the entire page of questions on malaria were about the make of the mosquito nets that are being used. And they, so the survey wanted to know which of these makes of mosquito nets were made? Dava Plus, Duranet, Interceptor, Life Net, Magnet, Net Protection, Oli Set, Permanent, Loyal Sentry, and so on. Some strange names. Now, who or not knows, in this room, I'm sure there are many people who use mosquito nets, I would like to know who in this room knows the brand of mosquito nets they use. Is there anyone in this room who knows this? No. Nobody knows. It will also interest you to know all these mosquito net brands are Chinese. The reason people wanted to know this is because some international NGOs have taken large grants to dis supposedly distribute mosquito nets for free in India. And they basically they use different brands. So what they were really doing, trying to do is to find out which uh, 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 which uh, mosquito net from which uh, 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 aid agency had reached where. That was basically the information they wanted to know. Perfectly reasonable if they want to know it. The question is why is India's taxpayer fund funded National Health Survey doing this for them? And those who did this survey clearly knew they were doing something fishy because although this is there in the questionnaire, it is not, the results of it are not there in the report, in HFS report. And so when I dug through this, I discovered that actually, since the very beginning, all our surveys of this kind are almost entirely done by design and uh, the questionnaires are put together by essentially some foreign aid agency, particularly USA, which by the way, since you do not know, is actually an extension of the US State Department. Next. You also have absurd questions in the NHS, which are just bizarre. For example, in order to understand the socio-economic background of the, the family that they are serving, they ask questions about their consumption and so on, fair enough. But look at the things that I want to know whether you actually use. Black and white television, radio and transistors. How many of us actually want? <laughs> Gotta be kidding me, why are these questions still there? Because they are mostly not interested in actually doing the survey. This is just fluff in order to actually do the kind of social engineering questions that they wanted to ask, question, uh, ask us. Next. And now we have a new problem. This is called the Environmental, Social and Governance Norms, ESG norms, which have now suddenly popped up everywhere in the world. It was first proposed in an innocuous um, paper published by the UN in 2006. And of course, who is going to say that you shouldn't have some ESG norms? I mean, we are all in favor of you know, good things happening to the environment, for governance, for society and so on. I am also in favor of it. 
I have no problem with having some norms. The problem is, there was no conversation about what the norm should be, who should do the certification, on what is the basis of the certification, and so on and so forth. And without any conversation with anyone else, a small group of institutions and NGOs, almost entirely in the North Atlantic, basically began to come up with these norms. And now they are getting rapidly hardwired into all kinds of things. What is also interesting is that when I began to dig into who are these agencies that are now doing this, I found that if you dig a little bit and look at the funding of those agencies, they are almost all done by three, three uh, funding sources. USAID, Ford Foundation and Soros's Open Society. These three funding sources almost entirely account for the entire ESG uh, thing. Of course, they don't do it up front. They do it through a layer of institutions. It's almost like, you know, when you have tax havens and you have layers of companies to convert black money and launder it and make it white money. In exactly the same way, opinions are being laundered through a network of NGOs, institutions, some of them repeatable institutions, universities and so on, and then being presented to you as objective views, whereas in fact they are the views of three institutions. I want to state again, I have nothing against ESG norms as a theoretical idea or even a practical idea if it was done objectively and honestly. The problem is what is being done here is clearly unethical. Next. Now you may have by now come to the conclusion that I am a conspiracy theorist who, who really is, you know, uh, 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 very suspicious of these kinds of uh, international, um, uh, you know, uh, imposition of you know, norms and so on. But there is a very long uh, history to why we think about this this way. And in order to understand this, let me give you one example. It is a, should be considered a reasonably well-known example, which is this issue of sex selection abortions that had plagued India in recent decades, particularly since the 70s and 80s. Uh, it's now being brought under control, but it had been a major issue as a result of which we have began to have gender imbalances at birth in India. And all of you will have read well-known papers on this, on the issue of why, of this uh, use of ultrasounds to essentially abort female fetuses, which cause these imbalances, particularly in states in uh, northwestern India, Haryana, western UP, Punjab, and so on, Delhi as well. So the question, I began to look into what is the origin of this? And there is actually a very nice book written by a Pulitzer Willing journalist called Mara Hazanpal, however you pronounce that name, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um, called Unnatural Selection, which talks about the history of how this happened. It turns out that in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, in reputable journals uh, in uh, Western universities, there was a series of papers about a fear that uh, 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 that, that was there in uh, many uh, Western academia, that population growth in Asia would be so fast and so quick that it would eventually lead to some sort of a Malthusian blow. And large numbers of papers were written on, on this issue about what has to be done about this. And one of the conclusions that were reached, and they are blatantly racist uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 approach, uh, despite, by the way, this is post Second World War, so they were not couched in the racist language that you would have, you know, pre Nazi, but in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, it, it was possible still to write in international journals in ways that now would be caught out very quickly. But basically, what happened is that these journals basically came to the conclusion that look, the population growth capacity of a country is the female population. So it doesn't matter how many men are born, what you really need to do is to intervene in such a way that the number of women born suddenly comes down. And so they began to preach to many countries, India, China and many others, to try and essentially find ways to curb the number of women being born. 
And so the Population Council sent a gentleman, and all of this is very well documented. You can read the original papers and everything online today. Population Council sent somebody called Selden Segal, the head of its biomedical division to New Delhi, where he served as the personal advisor to the Indian Armed Forces Lieutenant Colonel B. L. Raina, who was then the director of Planet Family Planning. And 1969, the former advocate uh, and the former advocated sex selection abortion as a means of population control. So this was very clearly the idea. And so Sigal's primary assignment in Delhi was to find the Department of Repro uh, to found the Department of Reproductive Physiology in Ames, the All India Medical College. So this is not some you know dark, dingy place somewhere away. All of this is happening in Central Delhi. This is Ames, the All India Medical uh, 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 Institute of Medical Sciences, and on Lodi Road, where all these institutions, Ford Foundation, etc., have the headquarters. So this is happening right in the Central Delhi. It is not. Therefore, surprising that when the emergency happened, there were all these forced sterilizations and other things. This is from that period. And very importantly, it is with the support of UN agencies, Ford Foundation and, uh, uh, and Rockefeller Foundation, that the first bunch of ultrasound machines were actually imported into India. And these ultrasound machines were then used to carry out these sex selection abortions the first four, five thousand of which actually happened in Ames. The people who carried out those abortions are still around. And so, the first round was one thousand and then many thousands were done. Next. So the point I'm making to you is, we have to be very, very careful about social engineering done to us in the name of good things. Population control is not a bad thing. But this sort of manipulation ultimately led to major skews in uh, birth. Now it isn't the case that there weren't uh, you know, male preference in India before this thing happened. It did. Most traditional societies do have a male bias. Right? But what happened is a case of deliberate weaponization of that male bias using technology, deliberately being done through manipulation. And therefore, the same lens needs to be taken when we think about these global indices and these ESG norms. Yes, they may be needed, but they have to be co-evolved involving the global south. We should only accept them when we understand why they are being done. We will only accept them when Many of these indicators are being not just co-evolved, but also being certified and monitored from somewhere outside of the North Atlantic. Next. So what needs to be done? Well, very clearly we need to turn the gates. If we are going to manage the planet, well, we have got to be partners of this thing. It cannot be outsourced to the North Atlantic. The world has shifted. The world does not live in the North Atlantic anymore. And this has to be, therefore, somewhere where we need quality domestic data. We have to take control of this. We have to question these things. And we have to take it up with agencies such as the World Bank. Importantly, Indian agencies now need to, whether it's academia, NGOs, Indian consultancies, credit rating agencies, we need to be able to do our own sovereign ratings of the world. We need to take up our own democracy index, freedom indices, and other global indices. The purpose of this is not somehow giving India high rankings. The methodologies should be clear, they should be debated, but it should be ultimately done in an honest way. This is the only way in which we can have a genuine partnership with the rest of the world, and this is the only way in which we ourselves will be able to make genuine progress. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We thank Sri Sanjeev Sanyanji for his captivating, articulate and thought-provoking address which has artfully conveyed a message that I am sure has resonated deeply with the gathering. It is time now to felicitate and thank our honourable dignitaries for sparing time from their busy schedule to be with us today. For those sitting in front, we shall be felicitating our guests with an eco-harmony token box 
as the name conveys, the box is an environmental friendly token that aligns with our commitment to sustainability efforts while also suggesting a sense of balance and harmony with nature. I now call upon Senior Professor Heron Dean, Department of Commerce and the conference patron, Professor Ajay Kumar Singhji, to felicitate our chief guest, Sri Sanjeev Sanyaji, Member Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister with the Eco Harmony Token Boss. Thanks to you, sir. I now call